which is uh, which is equivalent to abstraction, and this is this quantity is actually greater than zero. Uh, so this is the yield criteria in uh, in maximum shear stress theory. Now, can it be shown as uh, this also? So can you show this expression to be same as this expression? So both the expressions are equivalent. Can you show that? I'm guessing you have no clue. So let's say if I randomly assume, randomly, sigma 1 greater than sigma 2 greater than sigma 3, and you could be using any sequence. I mean, let's say sigma 3 greater than sigma 2 greater than sigma 1. And I don't care whether each of these quantities are positive or negative. Simply, uh, one uh, is the maximum, the other is the minimum. Then the third one is in the middle. So in that case, from the first expression, so let's call it 1, and let's call it 2, so from one, you would have this. Then when it comes to the last term, because sigma 3 is less than sigma 1, it is sigma 1 minus sigma 3. And if it is indeed the case that uh, sigma, uh, sigma 2 is the middle stress value, middle principal stress, so each of, uh, so basically we know that uh, sigma 1 minus sigma 3 is essentially sigma 1 minus sigma 2 plus sigma 2 minus sigma 3. Each of these are positive quantities, if you follow this. So this quantity is a sum of two positive quantities, which means it is actually greater than each of these two positive quantities. So basically, it is half of sigma 1 minus sigma 3 minus k. And similarly, from 2, you have this. So for the last one, again, I switched the positions of sigma 1 and sigma 3. And uh, then minus k. So even in this expression, these two will cancel out. And in the end, you have two sigma 1s and two sigma 3s. So So you get the same expression. Uh, same final expression from each of the original expressions. Okay. So basically, uh, and again, uh, this uh, sequence or this order of uh, higher to lower magnitude is uh, mm, is random. Okay, it is not random. Rather, it's uh, uh, it's arbitrary. That means you could choose sigma two in place of sigma one, sigma three in place of sigma two, and sigma one in place of sigma three. And you will still get identical expressions from both these representations. Okay. Uh, what is the advantage of the second representation is that you get to take uh, the derivative. Oh, 
of f okay easily with respect to sigma okay now i need you to uh, get that expression so imagine this sigma 1 minus sigma 2 is uh, i mean uh, so we assumed a specific case where sigma 1 was greater than sigma 2 and that was greater than sigma 3 but in general that may not be the case okay so we need this absolute values okay so this quantity may be assumed as square root of sigma 1 minus sigma 2 whole squared okay now can you take the derivative of this quantity derivative of this quantity okay with respect to say sigma 1 for example if i take del del sigma 1 of this quantity right here so at first i'll have to take derivative with, so i'll be using chain rule so at first i'll be taking derivative with respect to whatever it is inside so it is 1 by 2 the quantity itself because you know it is sigma 1 minus sigma 2 whole square to the power half right so it becomes half times sigma 1 minus sigma 2 whole square to the power minus half so this quantity over here and then i should be taking derivative of this so twice sigma 1 minus sigma 2 and that's it so so when i do take that derivative I'd be getting these twos will cancel out. So this is uh, actually, if you look at it, it is uh, minus one if uh, sigma two greater than sigma one and equals one if uh, sigma one greater than sigma two. Okay, so can you get the derivative of f with respect to, uh, sorry, so if, if like, uh, now I can represent the stress in the principal coordinates, and let's say I denote that with a hat as a vector, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. So can you get the gradient of f with respect to sigma hat? Yes, sir. So you had the earlier expression for if sir, earlier we got that one zero minus one in Tresca criteria. Yes, but that's not the general expression. That's when we probably assumed that sigma one. So that that's when we assume this, but this is not always going to be the case. I mean. Uh, If it turns out that sigma 1 is uh, lower than sigma 2, okay, or uh, if sigma 2 is, let's say, the highest value and sigma 3 is the lowest value, then that is not the expression that you are supposed to get. So you understand what I did over here, right? How to get, arrive at this, this set of expressions. Okay. So earlier, that earlier expression that you are talking about, that was with respect to having this assumption but if that is not the case what should be the expression of if Sir, Taholi ki three sets of vectors for woman sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, theme relation. Kuribore. Kiwalcha? 
বলছি যে এই যে আমরা যে আগে এজুম করেছিলাম সিগমা 1 গ্রেটার দ্যান সিগমা 2 গ্রেটার দ্যান সিগমা 3 হুম হুম अकॉर्डिंग टू दैट वी अराइव्ड इनटू 10 1 सिमिलरली इफ वी टू सिग्मा 3 ग्रेटर दैन सिग्मा 2 ग्रेटर दैन सिग्मा 1 देन वी विल हैव दैट रिवर्स थिंग लाइक -1 0 1 মানে সেটা তো হলো তিনটে সেট অফ ভেক্টর পাবো তিনটে ছটা কটা হবে আমি জানি না কিন্তু আমি বলছি যে উইথ দিস এক্সপ্রেশন রাইট হিয়ার উইথ the earlier expression 1 by 4 and whatever we wrote okay the ones with the absolute values that is one with, with uh, uh, one without this assumption okay without this assumption so from that expression i mean the way you can this is how you can take the derivative of uh, a, um, an expression uh, the absolute value of an expression okay so so there there would be three of such uh, you know uh, expressions with their absolute values okay and you need to take derivative of uh, so that itself is a single scalar so you need to take derivative of that with respect to each of the principal stresses So let's say we took the first term and that would give us one vector which is uh, 1 minus 1 0. So basically if you take if you had taken derivative with respect to sigma 3 this should be 0 right. And if you do sigma 2 that would again be plus or minus 1. So this depends on uh, okay. So this is like plus or minus this quantity then there would be a next quantity which is plus or minus zero one minus one then the third quantity plus or minus minus one zero one so this is this would be true when sigma 3 is greater than sigma 1 this should be true when uh, sigma 2 is greater than sigma 3 and this should be true when uh, sigma 1 is greater than sigma 2 actually i should do this So basically I'm taking derivative of each of the terms that are, you know, for which you are taking the absolute values. Of course, uh, to all of this, there is a one by four. probably being multiplied to it and please remember this is when you are taking derivative of or the gradient of f with respect to the stress in the principal coordinates
okay so i hope this part is clear um so for the next part we would start discussing discussing kinematic hardening so please remember this is what kinematic hardening is if this is your stress axis and this is your strain axis so imagine um there is this block right here and uh, in front of that there is a spring whose stiffness is e and uh, behind that there is a wall to which is connected another spring uh, a lot weaker spring which has a stiffness of h um and then the system itself is resting on a rough surface which uh, only allows friction force i mean uh, which only allows motion when the friction force uh, reaches this limiting value of sigma y0 okay and then you have uh, then you are applying certain force sigma over here so so initially uh, the block is stationary and only the elastic spring is elongating and at that time this is the free body diagram of the spring we have already done this exercise but let's say we revisit this okay so the elongation of the spring or epsilon e that becomes simply sigma divided by e okay and at this point when sigma is less than sigma y0 that is also the total strain okay and as soon as the block starts moving <clears throat> so this is the free body diagram of the block so there is sigma over here and this is sigma y0 resisting the motion the yield stress resisting the motion uh, but then there is uh, this additional part let's call it alpha which is known as the back stress okay so in this is what uh, represents the kinematic hardening okay this type of hardening is kinematic hardening with a spring behind the block uh, and uh, you know the coefficient of friction like with isotropic hardening what we are discussing that the coefficient of friction changes as the block moves to the left or to the right okay uh, in this case this this is not happening okay so what we are trying to do here we are trying to uh, you know develop a, a you know a block spring model which correlates okay uh, or uh, which uh, you know mimics the behavior of kinematic hardening okay so uh, let's say uh, so basically this is what the stress strain diagram would be so initially you are uh, elongating Mm. with elastic slope and then let's say this h is also not a constant this the second spring may be a nonlinear spring okay so at any instant the slope is a uh, tangent modulus and as we have discussed earlier this tangent modulus is simply <clears throat> simply h uh, h divided by 1 plus h divided by young's modulus and is approximately equal to h now what is h h is the slope of the stress to plastic strain diagram so that basically starts at sigma y0 so there the slope is h slightly higher than the tangent modulus so this is your sigma y0 okay and any stress you develop beyond this point is your back stress alpha okay so what does back stress do so uh, so imagine this is how the back stress is changing 
which is basically this line is basically parallel to the other one is just that uh, it starts from zero okay or even in the stress to plastic strain diagram this quantity is your alpha the back stress okay and that actually shifts the origin for your uh, for your stress okay so when you unload so let's say you unload at this point okay and you can identify the corresponding plastic strain by drawing a line parallel to the one with the elastic slope so so this gives you the current alpha value this is your current alpha value okay and the distance between uh, your actual stress and this alpha value is going to be your sigma y0 if there is solely kinematic hardening and no isotropic hardening and by the time you reach this uh, alpha value over here while unloading you are in some sense at the origin and beyond this alpha value you can have let's say another sigma y okay before you start yielding in compression and there you have your yield stress in compression reduced by the same amount uh, mm, mm, same amount as the increase in the yield stress in the tensile direction now if you instead of loading in compression started loading in elongation again once you reach the uh, horizontal axis that means uh, which gives you the plastic strain if you had you know started reloading in tension you will only start yielding corresponding to the stress sigma which is sigma y0 plus alpha okay so that also happens in this uh, in this case so let's say the block now starts moving and you suddenly reduce sigma so the block becomes stationary which basically means the spring in the left remains frozen in its elongated condition which basically means that as long as the block is stationary the force coming from here is still alpha and uh, the stress could be reducing so this f is again less than sigma y0 okay and it is reducing so it is uh, so only elastic deformation will happen so only elastic unloading will happen because only this spring is now uh, be losing its elongation so uh, and uh, and you start moving in the other direction okay only when you have a f acting in the opposite direction you applying sigma in this direction in the uh, other side negative x axis and uh, this your uh, sigma y0 is opposing your motion uh, and uh, this time uh, this time you are trying to move in the left okay so your uh, you know the uh, you only start yielding at uh, sigma equals sigma y0 minus alpha that's when you start moving towards the left okay and that's what this stress corresponds to that's what uh, is the reduction in the yield stress in compression because you have uh, had plastic deformation in tension uh, or basically you have hardened in tension that means your yield stress in tension has increased okay now all of this is basically a model uh, whether this diagram or whether what we are discussing over here is all of these are mathematical models that only is us uh, um, solving the uh, um, the real life problems okay in a simplistic way the actual material behavior is uh, is is different okay and actually when you uh, do unload okay and reload you don't follow the same curve you follow a curves which looks something like this and you don't start at the same point you basically you know uh, yield at a different point okay so this is how the curves differ okay and uh, this is only an approximation of that we have behavior only a simplistic approximation because uh, if i were to really model whatever is happening over there the model would be too complicated for me and that way uh, the actual purpose that is uh, you know to solve a design problem with ease that would not be served okay so we assume that this is what is happening okay 
that uh, it follows the same curve while loading and it yields basically uh, where it left off the plastic deformation okay so but this is uh, this is kind of the real life behavior of the material when you know unloaded and reloaded so uh, so this is what kinematic hardening looks like okay in uh, in one dimension in 3d this is what the kinematic hardening looks like Okay, I mean, I chose to do with, uh, you know, the, the mm, longitudinal stresses. Uh, I could also choose to, you know, replace them with shear counterparts. So this could be the shear yield stress. And in that case, this should be uh, one by root three of equivalent of sigma minus alpha. Okay, so unlike the isotropic hardening stress, which we discussed to be a scalar, okay, so isotropic hardening stress was like r as a function of lambda okay which was a scalar uh, alpha over here is a multi axial stress is a 3d stress okay so it has all the nine components and in principal coordinates also it has three components okay and uh, like uh, like r has a evolution law or not law like evolution or generation equation there could be various types the simplest one is uh, dr equal h times d lambda <clears throat> or uh, a more complicated ones could be something like this dr equals uh, q minus r times b times d lambda where q and b are material properties so when you integrate this quantity this essentially becomes r equals uh, q times uh, 1 minus e to the power minus b times lambda okay and recall what is lambda lambda is integration d lambda where d lambda is the equivalent plastic strain and this quantity being greater than zero lambda is always increasing so whether you are you know having uh, plastic deformation in uh, tension or compression lambda is always in increasing okay so so these are the different generation rules for the isotropic hardening stress and it being isotropic that is direction independent it's scalar okay and that simply appears uh, with sigma y as sigma y zero plus r okay and uh, and because of that uh, mm, that appears to this side where it is scalar okay and in a kinematic hardening the back stress okay is three dimension three dimensional and it simply needs to be uh, means a shift of origin now of course when we are doing one dimensional uh, you know uh, description there is only uh, in one in one direction that the stress can change and that is this vertical direction right here so the shift of origin only means shifting in the vertical direction okay but if we do uh, take that to be a 3d stress state okay so the uh, so, so the shift can happen at various direction for example if i were to take uh, a 2d principal uh, stress plane so sigma 1 sigma 2 right here and uh, let's say this ellipse is your von mises criteria okay and uh, what happens to So this was the original origin of the stress. Okay, now it probably has shifted to over here, and that shift is your back stress alpha. 
that shift uh, has the following components so this is one and this is the other one and that shift actually represents your uh, uh, the growth of the back stress so the back stress go grows from zero okay and uh, that growth is represented by that shift of origin okay now if we were to represent that in 3d principal stress space So imagine again this is the hydrostatic axis and let's say this is your this is your yield surface so growth of growth of plastic strain would mean that uh, again the back stress develops and grows in the uh, diverticular stress plane so if this much is the growth of the back stress so now your new newly formed yield surface would uh, would look something like this okay so you might notice that the size of the yield surface is not changing the yield surface is not changing its uh, you know uh, volume or the the surface area okay it's just that the origin is shifting and that's what is meant by the uh, how do i know the size is not changing because this k is not changing if there was isotropic hardening this k itself would be changing or sigma y0 would be changing okay uh, into changing into sigma y okay but uh, since that is remaining a constant so the surface the size of the surface is not changing what is changing is its origin okay now we talked about the generation equations for uh, the hydrostatic hardening uh, sorry isotropic hardening uh, now let's talk about uh, the generation equations for kinematic hardening so one thing we can do is we can make or we can take the differential change in back stress simply proportional to the differential change in plastic strain okay and that simple rule so th this is of course a linear kinematic hardening and this this model was proposed by prager so this is the prager hardening okay so the change in back stress is simply proportional to the change in uh, plastic strain and actually uh, you can also integrate this quantity so basically once you integrate alpha is uh, basically c times c times epsilon p the total plastic strain at this point in the material and this doesn't you don't have to bother that whether initially plastic strain was changing in this direction now it has changed in this direction 
and this has been the you know the net change in plastic strain so you don't have to bother about that it's such a simple expression in through this expression what you can do is you can simply represent the back stress the current back stress as the current plastic strain uh, proportional to current plastic strain okay now now the linear kinematic hardening uh, could also be written uh, in a different form for example it all could also be written like alpha equals d mu sorry d alpha equals d mu now mu is just another parameter like lambda so times uh, sigma minus alpha okay now let me tell you this is uh, so this this uh, equation is due to ziegler okay so this is prager equation so both are linear kinematic hardening okay uh, so one is uh, due to prager the other one is uh, uh, from ziegler okay now i would like to show you that there is some similarity between the two okay for instance for instance uh, epsilon p or rather d epsilon p so forget about the second expression the first expression d epsilon p as we know can be written as uh, d lambda times uh, 3 by 2 sigma equivalent s right but that's when actually it should be written as uh, not s it should be written as uh, del f del sigma now we know that when there is no hardening or only isotropic hardening f is something like this it is a sigma equivalent minus sigma y or basically sigma equivalent is a uh, Square root of three j two, and uh, j two, as we know, is uh, mm, your uh, one by two s inner product s. Okay. Now, this is with uh, mm, this is with either the isotropic hardening or so this is with no kinematic hardening. So there may or may not be isotropic hardening. but with kinematic hardening so then when we take uh, del f del sigma we have uh, that equal to sorry so it is d lambda times del f del sigma so this equal to uh, 3 by 2 sigma equivalent times uh, s right um yeah there also it is going to be s h okay but uh, with with your uh, kinematic hardening this is what f looks like with kinematic hardening this is what f looks like and that is uh, that is equivalent of sigma minus alpha minus sigma y and this quantity is essentially square root of 3 by 2 s minus alpha inner product s minus alpha now we know that the plastic strain itself is uh, deviatoric in nature because it is proportional to the deviatoric part of the stress uh, 
or the deviatoric part of the effective stress. So the effective stress is your sigma minus alpha. Okay. So, so because each of these quantities, the back stress, the plastic strain, all of these are uh, deviatoric quantities. So when I take the deviatoric part of uh, sigma minus alpha, so the deviatoric part of sigma minus alpha is also S minus alpha. Okay. So, <clears throat> so if instead of taking uh, this expression for J2, if, you, if I take this expression for sigma minus alpha equivalent, so then del F del sigma, del F del sigma becomes this. It becomes 3 by 2 sigma minus alpha equivalent. You know, it's just going to be very similar to what just happened. So times S minus alpha. Okay. So that makes this expression right here as a C times C times 3 by 2. So D lambda times 3 by 2. Now this quantity sigma minus alpha equivalent uh yeah we'll just call it sigma minus alpha equivalent times s minus alpha so what do we see here that eventually s minus alpha or uh, the vector part of the expression remains the same which basically means uh that for for von Mises plasticity, for von Mises plasticity, we have uh, the Prager and the Ziegler pointing towards the same direction. And also, if we choose our parameters correctly, it can also be shown that they also give you the identical values of back stress when you have von Mises plasticity. So basically the Prager and the Ziegler rule are identical when it comes to von Mises plasticity. Okay. Uh, but so this is what uh, they are saying. Mm, if I if I look at them in the three dimensional stress space, I mean the principal stress space, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three right here. So this is like the deviatoric plane. Okay. And uh, imagine this is your uh, von, Mises, von Mises surface. Okay. So, and also this one is your origin, let's say. So if you are currently at this stress value, If you are currently at this stress value corresponding to S, let's say. So we know that uh, what Prager is saying that your, uh, you know, uh, D alpha would be parallel to your uh, D epsilon P. And we know that that D epsilon P should be proportional to del F del sigma which is basically the gradient of uh, uh, of the surface. And as we know, the gradients are normal to the surface. Okay. So basically that would be along, uh, you know, that would be normal to the surface. And because it is normal to a circle, that means it is also along the radial line. Okay. Now, what does the radial line represent? You see, uh, if you join the actual origin, Okay, so from the to the center of the um, circle. Okay, so that part, this part right here is your hydrostatic stress. Okay, so this is sigma m times the identity matrix. And this part, this green line right here is your deviatoric stress S. Okay, so, uh, so what do you have here? Okay, 
you know now if your you know uh, uh, surface has shifted so this is going to be your s minus alpha okay so i mean if you have had certain amount of plastic deformation so this is going to be your s minus alpha so now we know two things one is this d epsilon p it is proportional to s minus alpha okay and since d alpha is proportional to d epsilon p it is also proportional to s minus alpha so that is coming from breger's rule and from ziegler's rule what we can see that it is by definition proportional to s minus alpha for breger rule uh, it was proportional to s minus alpha because it was proportional to d epsilon p and ziegler is you know uh, already mentioning it to be proportional to s minus alpha so both of them are giving you the same vector same direction now when it comes to let's say tresca criteria So if I join any point on the surface directly, what does this line represent? So this is everything happening in the deviatoric plane. So this line right here from the center of the hexagon. Okay. Uh, so I'm still talking in terms of everything in the deviatoric plane. So this quantity right here is uh, either S or S minus alpha. Okay. And uh, Let's say if I take a little oblique line, so this one is not a good example. Let's say if I take uh, this line right here, that also is S minus alpha, right? So that direction conforms to Ziegler. Whereas if you think about it, Prager actually requires you to find a normal at this point and on this entire surface this green line right here that normal is not changing so this direction conforms to Praga so although the two uh, linear uh, linear kinematic hardening rules are identical when it comes to von Mises criteria they are quite different for uh, Tresca criteria এই পার্টটা কি বোঝা গেল স্যার এই ট্রেসকাতে এটা যেরকম করলেন যে এই এজ এর উপর পারপেন্ডিকুলার এস মাইনাস আলফা যেটা আছে তো এবারে যে ভার্টিসেস গুলো আছে হুম ওইখানে যেরকম আমরা ডিসকাস করেছিলাম যে ওইখানে মোর দ্যান ওয়ান ডিরেকশনে Yes, actually they can at the vertices there are infinite number of directions possible ranging from uh, one side to other right so when ekta side er normal direction theke arekta side er normal direction porjonto je kono vector nite pari jeta typically kora hoy you can say we are you know mentally trying to smoothen that up so what we do is we take the average of the two normals shetai korte hobe ar to kono upay nei if you are at a vertex Okay. But how often are you at a vertex? Vertex means that vertex means that the your uh, one particular uh, uh, stress is sigma one is there, but all the other stresses are zero. Okay. So the Shirakomi Shotti ekta ghoto na ghote. Then uh, that is the uh, that is what you are supposed to do. But if that is not uh, that is not the general situation, right? In generation general situation, we will mostly be ending up uh, somewhere on that line, not at the vertex. Okay. So, shekhetre hotche. Mane, I need to be uh, in a position to identify the normal. Okay. Acha. Ita to holo. And how do we get the normal? So we discuss that. I mean, just you know, before coming to this space, that's what we are doing, right? 
we are taking all sorts of uh, gradient of the von Mises Friska uh, criteria. So, so I'm going to tell you that the two linear kinematic hardening model and they are mostly equivalent, at least when you are doing von Mises criteria. But if you choose to have a different uh, um, plasticity, uh, I mean, different yield criteria, that is going to be different. Ziegler criteria, uh, which says that d alpha is your d mu times your It says sigma minus alpha. Why does it say sigma minus alpha? Anyways, if it is sigma minus alpha, then we have this expression if defined as So I'm putting alpha bar. So you now I just checked and it says the expression is sigma minus alpha. So what I'm doing now is I'm taking alpha bar as a derivative part of alpha. Okay. So when I do take del f del sigma, <clears throat> so first of all that is like uh, sigma minus alpha equivalent okay so so what do you be doing one by two sigma minus alpha equivalent now i'm taking the derivative with respect to whatever is inside okay inside the square root so because it is a square root so to the power half so half times to the power minus half okay so then uh, what we'll be doing is uh, taking derivative of this so 3 by 2 s minus alpha then we would be doing sorry d sigma inner product d sigma because you see f is no should we be doing d sigma we are taking gradient of wave with respect to sigma 
Okay, okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah. We'll be getting this quantity right here. 3 by 2. And because it is like, uh, you know, uh, taking inner product of the quantity with itself, so we'll be getting a 2 over here. So it's like, you know, taking derivative of x squared with respect to x. So the two twos cancel out. So it is 3 by 2 sigma minus alpha equivalent times s minus alpha bar. And if we are talking about df, now df is something different from uh, this partial derivative. This time we are talking about total derivative. Okay. And the total derivative is uh, for which we will have to consider the changes in all the input quantities. So you see this s is the derivative part of the stress. The derivative stress is the derivative part of the stress. So you will also be considering the change in the back stress. So with isotropic hardening, when we took the total derivative, we considered the variation in S and variation in sigma Y and sigma Y would be changing with uh, lambda. So we considered the variation in lambda. Okay. So here, since the kinematic hardening term is in itself within the equivalent stress term, so uh, and this term is basically a constant with kinematic hardening. So the variation is df is uh, like del f uh, del sigma d sigma inner product d sigma. Okay, because once you take gradient of f with respect to sigma, you get a matrix. Take an inner product with d sigma, then you have your uh, you know the the first term in the chain rule, and then you need to take derivative with respect to alpha, gradient with respect to alpha, then do d alpha. Okay, uh, so so the first term is 3 by 2 sigma minus alpha equivalent. Okay. Then S minus alpha times uh, D sigma, inner product D sigma. And then you have del f del alpha and uh, that actually is going to be this quantity You see, because in the expression it is S minus alpha, it would come with a negative sign, S minus alpha. Okay. I mean, it's like if you have A minus B whole squared, and if you take partial derivative with A, you get uh, twice A minus B. If you take partial derivative with B, A minus B whole squared, you get twice uh, B minus A, which is uh, minus 2 A minus B. Okay, so again, I'm taking partial derivative with respect to alpha, basically gradient. So I'm getting this quantity, but with a negative sign, then uh, inner product with d alpha. Now there, if I substitute the expression from uh, Ziegler criteria, okay, uh, so that uh, we I'll be having this expression. First of all, the equivalent stress quantities I can simply get rid of. I can cancel them. So this quantity df is zero when, so df is actually mm,
df is zero while deforming plastically and uh, because f it's f is zero while deforming plastic f is in general less than equal zero in elasticity it is less than zero when it, in plasticity it is equal to zero so so in plasticity df itself is zero if f is zero throughout plasticity so df is also zero so this quantity is zero and i can simply you know cancel the two equivalent terms so and also this three by two terms everything i can cancel and then i have s minus alpha bar inner product d sigma equals d mu times s minus alpha bar inner product sigma minus alpha So basically, I have this expression for d mu, which is uh, s minus alpha in our product d sigma times uh, uh, or divided by s minus alpha in our product sigma minus alpha. Okay. Now this, of course, in relation to von Mises criteria, the general expression is this. That uh, d mu, so whether it is von Mises or Triska criteria, it is going to be the S minus alpha bar comes from del F del sigma, right? So in our product d sigma, and then over here it is again del f del sigma then uh, inner product sigma minus alpha because this sigma minus alpha is directly coming from ziegler criteria uh, what else that we should put this thing within macaulay brackets because if uh, the change in stress is happening opposite to uh, you know the normal to the surface if the change in stress is happening uh, change in stress is happening you know uh, opposite to the normal to the surface so this represents a normal so you are actually unloading and in that case so if in that case this inner product is going to be negative and whenever this inner product is negative you you are not developing any plastic strain neither are you generating more back stress so your back stress is frozen you like when that block is stationary and uh, you are simply unloading the spring the elastic spring right here okay because you are moving opposite to the normal to the surface okay may not be exactly opposite but actually you are moving somewhere inside the yield surface okay so you are not trying to move outwards so in the, so whenever this quantity is negative we should take the zero value okay so this is the general expression for d mu Okay, so one last thing. So one can modify. So remember, 
Braggart expression. So we should simply say that uh, d alpha is uh, proportional to d epsilon p. Okay, and actually uh, imagine if I switch that c to some other expression. Okay, slightly different expression. Multiply with two by three. Okay, that still is some c, right? Two by three times c is some c. So it is uh, still that linear expression right here. But now if I add a feedback term. Okay, or uh, some sort of regularization. Or some sort of a feedback term. Where I'm using actually the actual value of alpha. Okay, uh, times gamma. So these two right here are material properties, C and gamma. And then multiplying that with uh, d lambda okay and please recall that this d lambda is uh, a signless quantity the plastic strain might increase so in tension it is let's say increasing in compression it is decreasing so of course it's a matrix and or a tensor second order tensor and it has multiple components but all of those components can have sign but this d lambda right here cannot have a sign okay so what does this do? So, for example, uh, this is what the kinematic hardening, linear kinematic hardening would look like without the feedback term. So, this is the Prager term. Okay. And uh, this uh, modified one. Okay. So, so this modified one is a uh, actually able to model the material behavior more accurately it's true that as the material deforms its hardening also changes so this does this okay so uh, you know as the uh, as the back stress increases the rate of back stress increment also changes okay it reduces rather and uh, you get a curve like this okay and uh, this behavior is actually able to model uh, the Boschinger effect. More accurately. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, this model can be further, uh, you know, modified to incorporate, uh, a, you know, a temperature dependent term, which is like del C del theta, where theta is the non-dimensional uh, temperature okay so with that you can go for something called shabosh kinematic hardening okay so this is your assignment for the day read about what is shabosh kinematic hardening okay so there is just additional term over here one additional term Okay, so that becomes a Shabosh kinematic hardening. Okay, so we'll stop here regarding kinematic hardening. And uh, in the next class, we'll probably.